be by grace and to know it and to rejoice in the God of our salvation, isn't it? Well, let's open the scriptures this morning to the book of Galatians, chapter 4, and I have been assigned uh, the free adoption of grace, that which takes us to be in God's family, having to do with the fullness of time. And we had the first seven verses there, and I'd like to read them together to begin with. Galatians chapter 4, beginning with verse 1. Now I say that the heir, as long as he is a child, delivereth nothing different, nothing than a servant, though he be Lord of all, but is under tutors and governors until the time appointed of his father. Even so, we, when we were in children, were in bondage under the elements of this world. But when the fullness of time was come, God sent forth his Son, made of a woman, made under the law, to redeem them that were under the law, that we might receive the adoption of sons. And because ye are sons, God has sent forth the Spirit of his Son into our hearts, crying, Abba, Father. Wherefore thou art no more a servant, but a son. And if a son, then an heir of God through Christ. And God add his blessing to the scripture reading this morning. Now this particular passage describes something that should be unspeakably precious to every child of God. And that is adoption into his family. It's wonderful to be adopted into a family, even naturally speaking, because many times parents cannot take care of their children properly. Sometimes the parents die, or perhaps the children are abandoned. And this is a sign to the child that he is wanted, he is cared for, and he is loved. These particular believers of Galatia had a problem. They had lost something very special. And no, it wasn't their salvation, it wasn't their position before God, but it was a sense of the blessedness that they enjoyed. You see, when Paul came to them, they were lost heathen. Many of them had been brought up in Jewish legalism, and they were uh, joined together by the Holy Spirit into one body that we call the church. And because of that, they rejoiced. They had the peace of God that passed all understanding. They had the joy and the enjoyment of their salvation. Unfortunately, they began to listen to the voice of the enemy. And the enemy can be very convincing and very subtle at times. And he takes people that are uh, very sincere that they are correct. Uh, in fact, they had come with the word of God saying that, yes, uh, you're saved by grace, but you need to really get under the law and get with it if you want to please God in your Christian life. And when they began to do that, all of a sudden it seemed like that spirit of joy began to leave them. And when that happens, there are two things that can happen to a Christian. They can either, number one, become overcritical and start looking at others and seeing all of their faults and foibles and to criticize, or they can look at themselves and say, I cannot live up to this measure, to this divine standard that God has for me. And all of a sudden they begin looking away from Christ and the power of the Spirit and looking to self uh, uh, to, to bring them through. And when that happens, either one of those two, we have been taken prisoner by the enemy in this great conflict that we call the Christian life. Now, he begins with an illustration here in the verse, first two verses, and it's actually a continuation of what he's been teaching in chapter 3. Uh, for example, in verse 29 of the previous chapter, he concludes that if he be Christ, and he's not questioning whether we are Christ's, but he's saying, in fact, that we are Christ, then there are certain things that are true. First of all, that we are Abraham's seed, and number two, that we are heirs according to God's promise in Christ. Now, that's a very strange thing for Gentiles to be heirs to. How can we, as alienated and strangers from the covenants of God's promise with Israel, 
Say that now, somehow, some way, that we are Abraham's seed. You see, Abraham was the father of the Jewish people. And uh, whenever they looked back to their beginnings and, and so forth, they looked to Abraham as their example. And that was certainly true for the Jewish people. But let's think this through just a little bit. If we are in Christ by a divine baptism performed by the Spirit of God, we become one with Him and initiated into everything that Christ is. And if Christ is Abraham's seed, according to the flesh, then spiritually speaking, it can also be said that we are the children of Abraham. Come back to chapter 3 for just a moment and verse 6. And this is the actual beginning of his dealings with Abraham in the context of Galatians. Galatians 3, 6 says that even as Abraham believed God and it was accounted to him for righteousness, know ye therefore that they which are of faith, the same are the children of Abraham. And the scripture foreseen that God would justify what? The heathen? Yes. That simply means the Gentiles, those people of the nations, through faith, preached before the gospel unto Abraham, saying, In thee shall all the nations be blessed. And Abraham became a symbol, an example of faith to all nations, that just as Abraham was saved by grace through faith without the law, that we Gentiles can also look to God in Christ for that example. So then, they which are of faith are blessed with faithful Abraham. Yes, we become children of Abraham, spiritually speaking, but not only that, but we have an inheritance and we are heirs according to the promise. And I take the promise here to be the promise of eternal life, of justification by faith, of having that promise that we are going to enjoy all the blessings of heaven and everything that God has for us. So he begins in chapter 4 with this example from something in human life that they can all relate to. You see, in the Hebrew people, and also with uh, the, uh, the Romans and, and even the Greek people, there was a custom of the day that was called the adoption ceremony. And uh, many times when we think of adoption, we think of bringing a stranger's child and adopting them into our family. And it's very precious when that happens. But in this day, an adoption was simply placing as a full-grown son those that were already members of the family. And that was also precious because before that time, they were under governors and tutors. They were under the little nannies that were hired by the family, many of which were slaves themselves. And this heir, uh, even though he was potentially heir of all things and, and was a child within the family, he had not come to the place of maturity in, in his life. And so he had to be under these rules and regulations uh, to bring him up until the time that he could uh, enter into that inheritance. Potentially, he was Lord of all, but he was no different than a slave or a servant in that he had to obey and, and people told him what to do and what not to do. Now, these uh, tutors and governors were actually uh, slaves within the family. They were not hired as we think of today. Uh, but they were very special slaves. They were educated in how to bring up children. And we think, well, that's the burden of the parents, right? Well, yes, it is. But in wealthy families, they could actually have people uh, that were brought in as slaves to do much of this uh, burden of, of child rearing. And um, it came to a time in the child's life appointed by the father that they would be brought up and there would be a grand ceremony and a celebration festival in which they were actually publicly declared to be full-grown sons 
in the family of God. And they could then enjoy all the rights and privileges. And I appreciate a great deal what John Fredrickson said last night about that. That uh, the illustration that you weren't able to drive until a certain age and the time came when you could go and take your driver's license and then have that freedom. I think that that was a wonderful illustration. Even so we, Paul says, whether we be Jews or Gentiles, we were under this bondage to the elements of the world. Now the elements here refer to the elementary things, the, the rudiments of our early life. And that uh, was true of the Hebrews, it was true of the heathen as well, because they had their rules and regulations uh, with their idolatry and with their uh, satanic religion. Uh, they had to do certain things in order to appease their gods as well. And Paul says you have been saved out from under that system. If you were Hebrews, you were under the law of Moses. As heathen, you were under the law of your heathen religion. But he calls them elements or elementary principles. But the wonderful contrast here that he draws but when the fullness of time was come, that was the time appointed of the Father, God sent forth His Son, made of a woman, made under the law. Now, the Lord Jesus Christ had a certain sonship a position that He came into as well. We know that when He was born in Bethlehem, that He was indeed the Son of God. He was being manifest in the flesh, but there was a certain sense in which he himself put himself under these governors and tutors, these elementary principles, if you will, of the law, for a very special purpose, first of all, that it might be proved that he was sinless, that he was able to keep all of God's will and all of God's law perfectly, in order that he might be qualified to be the sin offering for all people, whether Jew or Gentile. And secondly, through resurrection, he came into that sonship position and exalted above all heavens and to fill all things, that he might bring all sons of his into glory, into that exalted position in Christ. Well, it says to redeem them that were under the law. Isn't that why He came? The Son of Man has come to seek and to save that which was lost. And, and that was the Jewish people. Uh, they were doing very well outwardly speaking and conforming to the outward law. But inwardly, their hearts were far from Him. And it was being manifest in their lives. Well, the Galatians had a similar problem, not in position, but in their behavior. We're going to see later today that they were beginning to bite and to devour each other. They were becoming envious of each other, even pro provoking to anger many times. And isn't that what legalism always does to the heart? It makes us critical and judgmental. We can always see the faults in other people, uh, but we can't seem to see it in ourselves. And so it was with those under the law that Christ came, He was born of Mary, of a virgin. He lived a perfect life in order that He might redeem or buy out of the slave market of sin those that were under the law. Now, back in the Old Testament, there's a famous prophecy in the book of, uh, of uh, Exodus. There in chapter 4, verse 22, it says, Israel is my son, even my firstborn. Hosea chapter 11 says that when Israel was a child, then I loved him and called my son out of Egypt. And yes, Israel as a nation was a child, was, was a potential son. But there had to be a 1,500 year process in which they were under tutors and governors and the elements of this world as a special discipline 
to bring them up until the time of Christ, that they might be justified by faith. And yes, Christ subjected himself to that system for their sake. And yet we see that we Gentiles also partake of this. Because he goes on to say in verse 5, that we, that is Jew and Gentile, might receive the adoption of sons. He changes the pronoun in this verse. You might expect it to read this way. To redeem them that were under the law, that they might receive the adoption of sons. But God had a much larger plan than he even revealed in prophecy. Yes, he came and lived a perfect life under the law. He went to the cross. He spread out his hands and shed his blood to redeem his people Israel. But here Paul says, not only that, but he had in mind the sins of the whole world. Amen. And that include the, included the Gentiles. Now we have our key word here, which is adoption. It's Paul is the only one that speaks of adoption in the Bible. And I think it's a beautiful illustration of who we are in Christ. The thing that Paul wants to bring these people to is not to say, don't be legalistic. Uh, don't be critical of other people. He does say that later. But at this particular point in time, he wanted them to see who they were in Christ. <laughs> They wanted to appreciate everything that God had done for them, that they are no longer under those little tutors and nannies and so forth, but God has placed them as full-grown sons in His family. And you might be saying to yourself, well, I can't be a son of God. I'm, I'm a woman or I'm a, I'm a girl. And uh, can you become a, a son of God? Yes, if you're saved by the grace of God, you too have that position as a full-grown son of God. And that's something that's just a little bit against nature. Because according to the, the custom here of the Hebrews, it was always the firstborn that had the inheritance. You may have other sons, and they also had a certain inheritance, but it was always the firstborn that had the lion's share of that inheritance. And perhaps the girls didn't get anything because it was assumed that they would be married off uh, to somebody perhaps that had the inheritance of some kind. But here, we're talking about spiritual verities and how God deals with all of His people. They are no longer children or minors in the family of God, but now, whether you be male, female, whether you be 12 years old, uh, whether you be a teenager, you have immediately entered into that sonship position. Now this illustration uh, tells us a great deal about God and His character. I think many times whenever we deal with our children, we are a little bit hesitant to give them too much too soon. Not thinking that perhaps that they can handle it. And they have to prove to us that they are worthy and they're faithful of our trust. And yet the very moment that we become a child of God through faith in Christ, He puts us into that sonship position. He says, this is your position. Now, what are you going to do with it? Right. You know, are you going to take advantage of your father? Are we going to say, this is the most wonderful thing that God has ever done for man? We can abuse it, we can use it incorrectly, but now it says that we have the Spirit of Christ. And that Spirit that has entered in has cried, Abba, Father. We love Him now because He first loved us. He loved us and gave Himself for us, and now that Spirit has shed abroad in our hearts all of God's love. And now he says, what are you going to do with that love? Are we to put it upon the altar of sacrifice back to Christ? Are we going to manifest that love to others that they might enjoy it as well? 
Well, he continues in verse 6. And if you are sons, and yes we are, God has sent forth the spirit of his son into our hearts, crying, Abba, Father. Keep your place here and come back to the book of Romans for just a moment. Romans chapter number 8. And there's a wonderful parallel passage here having to do with our sonship adoption. Now remember, with sonship, you can either take a person that's already a child and make them a son within your family, or you can adopt them out of the family from a stranger's family and give them the position in grace as full-grown sons. And here we see that Paul is dealing primarily with the Gentiles. Yes, there were Jews that were saved by the grace of God and the preaching of the gospel of grace, but by and large, they were Gentiles. And this is what he says about that. Verse 15. For you have not received the spirit of bondage again to fear. And isn't that what the law system always did? The main motivation that the people had under the law was fear. Because God said, if you obey me, then I will bless you. But if you fail and you disobey, not only will I not bless you, but I will bring upon you horrible curses. And you will feel my sore displeasure. And we have only to look at the history of Israel under that 1500 year law program to see that it was a treadmill for the flesh. That they would begin to try to obey, they would falter, God would discipline them, and then they would be brought in, back into the bonds of the covenant again. They would return wholeheartedly to the Lord. But it only lasted for about one generation. And they always fell back on the treadmill, uh, backward, and, and, and fell. So what we learned yesterday was that that law was a temporary discipline or a schoolmaster to bring them up until the time of Christ that in order that they might be saved by faith and enjoy justification in Christ. And now we're not under that system. We don't have to wonder and worry what's going to happen to us. Because God has said we have been blessed with every spiritual blessing in Christ in heavenly places. And now I don't have to wonder and worry if I'm going to get to heaven because I'm there in my representative. How about you? Right. Amen. Okay. And then it continues that the Spirit bears witness with our spirit that we are the children of God. God has given that, that inward witness of His very presence to bear witness with us that we are indeed His children. And I really think that the King James Version doesn't always do justice to do these two words, children and sons. Mm -hmm. The word children here is technon, which means a, a, a minor child or a small child. And then the word huios has to do with that sonship position of adoption. Come with me, please, back to the book of Galatians. This time, chapter 3. In chapter 3 and verse 26, we heard last night that ye are all the children of God by faith in Christ Jesus. Amen. But really, that word children ought to be huios in the Greek, which means the full-grown son. Right. And uh, we are no longer under those governors and tutors. Let me show you another example of that. Come with me, please, to the book of Ephesians, chapter number 1. Ephesians, chapter 1. And there, for a third time, Paul uses the key word, full-grown sons, or adoption. Ephesians chapter 1 and verse 5. Having predestinated us unto the adoption of children. Again, the word huios, 
means full-grown son. Right. And uh, sometimes, even in back in the book of John, it talks that uh, John talks about becoming the sons of God, even to them that believe on His name. That word is tekna, which means a small child. Israel at that time had not yet come into their sonship position. But God still has a plan with Israel. Uh, after the rapture, God is going to bring that entire nation into their sonship position as they enter into the kingdom glory. But here, it's predestinated us unto the adoption of sons. How? Not by self-effort, not by the law, but by Jesus Christ and in Him alone. And it's all according to the goodwill of God's pleasure. And uh, God has a great deal of pleasure that He takes in us in giving us those free gifts. Now, as we come back to the book of Galatians, chapter 4, we're in a much better position now to appreciate all of the grace and the glory that the sonship position entails. Yes, God has given us the spirit of His Son. We cry within our hearts, Abba, Father. Somebody said the word Abba is the very first word that a small child can pronounce. And uh, if you ever have heard a, a little baby babble, they often go Abba, 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 Abba. And, and it's kind of like the first thing that they can utter. And you would think that if becoming a full-grown son within God's family, we could say something just a little bit more <laughs> grown up, perhaps, or profound. But God loves that. That Abba, that, that, that term of endearment, that we have a relationship with God in Christ. We become His Son, He becomes our Father, and now we can address Him in terms of endearment. So He says, Therefore we are no longer a servant. We're not under the tutors and governors like the slaves were, but we are an heir of God. Now that word heir is a key word in the passage as well. Because that means that we own everything that Christ owned. Christ has become the heir of all things. And if we are in Christ, by means of that supernatural baptism, now it can be said that we possess all things in Christ. Come with me please back to the book of 1 Corinthians. 1 Corinthians chapter number 1. Now let's make that chapter 3. 1 Corinthians chapter 3. First Corinthians 3 and verse 21. He's talking about our position in Christ. And he says, Therefore let no man glory in men, for all things are yours. Whether Paul or Apollos or Cephas or the world, or life, or death, or things present, or things to come, all are yours, and ye are Christ's, and Christ is God's. And sometimes we get the feeling that, you know, we have one mentor, or we have one preacher in our faith. One of the things that I've learned to appreciate about this conference is the multiplicity of teachers and pastors that minister to us. And I thank God for each and every one of them. Because there isn't a time that I come to a meeting like this to what I don't learn at least one thing in each message. And I've been preaching this message for many years. I may learn just a little bit different perspective than what I've been used to. And I like to be stretched like that. To know that God has given me all these preachers and all things that pertain to life and godliness. Well, thank God for each and every one of them. Amen. Now, we become heirs of God through Christ. And once we begin to get a hold of that and the realization that God hasn't withheld anything that is for our spiritual benefit, we begin to rejoice in God again. It takes our eyes off of self and onto Him to whom the glory really belongs. 
One final passage I wanted to look at today, back in Romans 8. He's already told us that that spirit has come in, crying, Abba, Father. But God has a glorious future for every son of God. And there's coming a day that we are going to enter in fully into that inheritance and appreciate it in a way that we've never done before. He begins by saying in verse 22 that uh, we know that the whole creation groaneth and travaileth in pain together until now. And we, we don't have to go very far. We can just look at our own bodies and say that we are a fall of that, part of that fall of creation and we can certainly identify with that Paul. Uh, we have pains. We have physical aches and, and hurts. We have spiritual pains and hurts. And we have mental pain. And that, that's all part of living. And not only the creation, Paul says, but we ourselves also, which have the first fruits of the Spirit, we as believers and full-grown sons are not immune to the harms and the pains of this life. Even we, Paul says, grow within ourselves, waiting for, what? The adoption. Now wait a minute, Paul. I thought we already had the adoption. Didn't I just say that the very moment that we believe, we have it? Well, yes, in Christ we do. But as far as our physical bodies, we are still living in a fallen, mortal, pain-bearing body. And God says, there's coming a day that I'm going to take you to glory and you are going to realize that sonship position in its fullness and in its joy. To receive the adoption, what is that? The redemption of the body. And I stand before you today in an unredeemed body. Yes, in a sense, God has redeemed the body because he says that uh, he has redeemed us. We are bought with a price, the precious blood of Christ. And that's body, soul, and spirit. But in another sense, I am living in an unredeemed body. And, and so are you. And when that, the Lord Jesus Christ comes in the fullness of the blaze of his glory, we are going to become like him. We are going to share in that glory. And God says that is the blessed hope that we all look forward to. And that blessed hope isn't just an intellectual exercise, but it is something that affects our life. When we look to Christ and we think that He can appear even before this message has completed, that affects our life, doesn't it? That we don't want to be ashamed before His coming. We want to hear that good and faithful servant. And the question we need to ask ourselves this morning, what is it that we are doing with our position in Christ? What are we doing with our sonship adoption? Are we keeping it to ourselves? We can rejoice in all of these things, but God says to share this with all those that are saved by the grace of, uh, that need it. Come with me to 1 Thessalonians. And I want to close here. Because this is such a beautiful testimony of how the Thessalonian church, that we now know as the model church, uh, became just so enamored with this message of grace that they couldn't shut up. He says in chapter 1 and verse 6 that you became followers of us and of the Lord, having received the word in much affliction. And sometimes I think that we American Christians have had it so easy that we tend to forget and get cozy in our little comfort zone and um, we don't branch out and, and, and share Christ with others. But these people certainly were. In much affliction they received it, and in much affliction they were sharing it. With the joy of the Holy Ghost. So that you were examples to all that believe in Macedonia and Achaia. 
For from you sounded out the word of the Lord, not only in Macedonia and Achaia, but also in every place your faith to God word is spread abroad, so that we need not to speak anything. Wouldn't that be wonderful as a grace preacher if our people caught the spirit of adoption in such a way that we just had to teach them and then they would go out and do the work of the ministry. That's really the goal of our ministry is not that we do the work of the ministry, but we might train them as to who they are in Christ and that that love and joy might flow out of their hearts so much that they just can't shut up about it about the love of Christ. Well, my prayer this morning is that we, many of us are teachers ourselves, might bring this position before our people back home and that they can have the peace that brings all understanding, the joy that, that brings a testimony that people can see Christ within us. Let's pray to that end this morning. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for this precious portion of Scripture, a Scripture that brings us into the very presence of God Himself, not merely as children under governors and tutors, but as full-grown children within your family. And we thank you that we possess all things in Christ, that you haven't held back anything that is beneficial to us. We pray that we will take this message of grace and not forget the wonder of it. Not become so complacent in our comfort zone that we fail of the grace of God. We pray that we understand that we don't have to please you by rules and regulations, but simply by walking in your spirit as we follow your word given to our apostle, the apostle Paul. We pray, our Father, that indeed we might walk by faith and not by sight. We give all these things into your hands this morning for the namesake of him whose name is above every name. We pray this in his name. Amen.